morning, everyone. It is Sunday, July 5th, 2015, our Independence Weekend. The subject is God. Golden text, Genesis. Behold, I am with thee and will keep thee in all the places whither thou goest. Uh, this is such a, a good lesson this week and the story of Jonah that we are definitely going to get into it. I have a few things to talk about today, so I'm not sure we'll get into prose work this morning. But I'd like to start with that uh, golden text and or responsive reading. Any comments on it? Well, to me it meant, excuse me, that no matter what, God is always with me. No matter what I do, he's there, whether I recognize him or not. And I think that's such a safety and a protection. Thank you. It also uh, speaks to those times when we think that God is not there, uh, when we think that maybe we, we somehow he's drifted from us or we've drifted from him. And if, and if we ever feel that way, that we can't that feel like we can't hear God, or if we feel like we can't feel God here, it's not that he's not there. It's that we've drifted off someplace the wrong direction. Um, and even if we do that, but we drift off into the wrong direction, God is still there. Yeah, absolutely. I, I've had problems where I've drifted, of course, and just couldn't get my thought to where I thought it should be, and I would just say one word, God. God, God, and that helped me get back on track because the statement is the absolute truth. I mean, you're never separated from God. Even for a minute you think you might be, you're not. Thank you. Yeah, it's been likened to, you know, the sun shining. Maybe the clouds come over and you can't see the sun, but the sun is there. Once the clouds disperse, you feel and see it. So it's the clouds of our mortal thinking that would make us feel we are ever separated from God. And as I mentioned on the forum, this verse, you know, people that are traveling, and whether you are traveling, you know, on the road, um, taking a, some kind of a trip, or whether you're just going to the store, the idea that, behold, I am with thee and will keep thee in all the places whither thou goest. So... God is with you, and know that as you as you are about your day. Every place you go, he is there. And if you're mindful of that, if you're mindful of his presence, everything will go so much better, it will be so much more beautiful, and your experience so much better. And the power of God, which is what this lesson is about. I have the uh, idea of a fish swimming in the sea. God is totally around us everywhere. You can't get away. <laughs> He's there. The belly of the whale. <laughs> yeah. It reminds me of the uh, story someone once told about uh, one day Miss Betty was uh, going to address the people. And as she uh, entered the door, as she approached the door into the room where she was going to be uh, addressed to people, she stopped for a, a few seconds before she opened the door and went into the room. And afterwards, uh, one of her uh, students asked her what she, why, she, why she hesitated. But she stopped to let the Christ go before her. In other words, she was, she was getting her thought prepared to be God's spokesman so that she would recognize that the Christ filled the room. 
it's a, it's a beautiful example. And remember it for yourself. You know, if you're ever uh, going on a, a job interview, all kinds of different things. But for this round table, I pray that prayer to let the Christ go before me so that only, only that will be heard and felt, seen, the power of the Christ. Because it's that that, that heals and it's that truth that saves. When you, and when you do that, then no personal sense can enter into that room or that place where you're going. That's right. Yeah. And, and any fear or anything else will believe because uh, God is using you and, and all sense of self dissolves. And it's that sense of self which is personal sense. Anyone else on any of this before we get into the story of Jonah? <clears throat> and I, we had a, a great forum this week. I'm grateful. It should be every week active like that. A lot of good participation. And thank you to those of you who uh, gave some Bible study information. Is Connie on live or is she not? No. Okay. All right. Any, anyone else on any of this? Well, I, I could tell you about something I went through, just similar in a way to what you're talking about. Um, I used to, um, uh, this is like one of the first things that um, really sort of helped me when I first became a member of the Plainfield Church. So I used to come home from work, and um, I just get tremendously sad about everything. So I uh, stand there in front of the apartment door and getting the keys out and everything. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, that's one of the things I learned is not to do that. And so then I started coming home, and uh, when I stood before the door, I would just know that uh, this is uh, God reigns supreme in my home. He's the governor of everybody who's there. You know, and the sort of sense of uh, extreme sadness when I come home just wasn't there anymore. Thank you. That's beautiful. Thank you, Tom. Because up until he found church, as many of us, you know, he had a troubled home. Uh, and, and in doing that, everything has changed. You know, we were taught years ago when you leave your home to know that the presence and power of God is there. I always think of, as I've told some of you, the angels of the angel Michael, which is the angel of war, and the angel Gabriel, the angel of peace are in your home. Uh, the angel of war, meaning defending, protecting, <laughs> fighting, the great strength and comfort. And then Gabriel, the angel of peace, which it ministers to, to your needs with comfort. Know that that fills your home because, again, as this lesson brings out, God is all present. There is nothing besides God and as we talked about last week, if, he, if, if Albert Einstein saw this, please let us not have our eyes closed to the truth that is in our textbook. Mrs. Eddy was an advanced thinker, a radical thinker, and we must be so as well, opening our thoughts to these truths that will only bless your life. All it can do is bless Never harm. Anybody else? Thank you, Tom. I always like that uh, 23rd Psalm, 4th verse, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, walking through, it's such a promise. You always ever stuck. <laughs> taking us through. Thank you, Lillian. Yes. Yeah, I mean, and, and that's, again, where we have the choice, don't we? We're going through hell. We either we have a choice of either continuing to walk through it or stop and get stuck in it. Yeah, never stop walking. As long as you have light enough to take one step, you keep walking. And and God will see you through this dark tunnel if you're going through one. 
Someone gave me a mug, actually Jeremy gave me a mug recently with a quote from Winston Churchill. Never, 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 never give up. Give in. You don't ever give up to the suggestions of mind. Thank you, Lillian. Also, um, knowing God's presence helped me when time traveling. Um, I was traveling through a city with multiple lanes and I was in the middle. And instead of being intimidated, I could see the perfect order of God's, God's organization with the traffic flowing absolutely perfectly and with no incidents at all. And, and that gave me peace and it was wonderful. Thank you. That's you're always thinking something, so why not think that? Think, put a blessing when you're traveling. Put a blessing on everyone that's driving in their cars. And as we've been taught to know that God is behind the wheel of your car and the, behind the wheel of every other car on the road. This is loving your neighbor as yourself. Uh, rather than sitting in your car thinking, oh, this, that, and the next thing, and all this traffic, and all these people, and... Uh, why not think the truth? Why not think the right thought? And if you do that, God will open the way for you. He will. It brings out also in this book. Anybody else? Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, Put that down when you come home. Right. That's right. Pray before, during, and after you get home. And know that there's no letdown, that, that the peace and harmony of wherever you are, were, is still there, and that everyone received a blessing. Okay, Jonah. Who would like to begin? What about the town, the town of, or the city of Nineveh? Does anyone know what it was? Wasn't it the capital of the Assyrian Empire? That's correct. It was at the time a big city and the center of commerce. Well, for the wickedness. That's the right. Wicked, it was a wicked city. A wicked city. I read it now as the city of Mosul in Iraq. But anyway, uh, it was a very wicked city at that time. And what was Jonah commissioned to do by God? Go there and try to change to them. Yes. And and who was Jonah briefly? A prophet. Right. A prophet. So he he had a mission to go and to speak to these people who were very wickedly. And why didn't Jonah want to do that? He was afraid. He was I think afraid. he wanted them to be punished. I'm sorry, what was that? He wanted them to be punished. <laughs> yes. Yeah, he didn't think it was a good idea. Anybody else? I, is Florence on today? No. No, yes, she's traveling too. Well, he had a bad case of me, I don't want to. Pardon me? He had a bad case of I don't want to. Right, he did. Yeah, Connie's not on live either. Well... Tom, did you want to speak to this? Oh, I had some other thoughts. But, uh, what were you asking? Well, about uh, Nineveh and why Jonah didn't want to go there. Oh, okay. Well, I guess I was thinking, can I say this first? Like uh, Nineveh, I just thought it was interesting that where Abraham's father traveled to from Ur of the Chaldees to Haran, mm -hmm. that's not too far from Nineveh. Oh, okay. All right, just uh, sort of geographical location, but um, just thought interesting. Also, I thought the Mosul was interesting too. So, yeah, about um, why didn't you want to go to Nineveh? 
Um, sounds frightening. It's like one of the largest cities in the world. And <laughs> what are you going to do? Yeah, it, it was, but <laughs> I, I, as a prophet, I don't believe he was uh, uh, motivated by fear. But what I read was that he um, he foresaw that the Ninevites would repent and they would find favor with the Lord, and then disgrace to Israel. I think Florence wrote about that, or some others too, maybe Connie. Connie did, Connie did. yeah. So he he didn't he didn't want to forgive. These were wicked people. These were Israel's enemies, and he didn't want to go and convert them. And, and make them better, and then better than maybe the Israelites were. So, motivated was, by fear. Pardon me? What I read was this year. Whoever was speaking, we lost you. Oh, I just, this is Connie, I just dialed in because I thought, well, I think I better. Yeah. <laughs> and my um, device was still on, but I turned it off. Okay. So are we still on Nineveh and Assyria? Yes, and why Jonah didn't want to go there. Okay, um, he had prophesied the destruction of Israel, and he knew that uh, the Assyrians were the ones that were going to destroy Israel. And he didn't want to go and, and save them, because then they would come and destroy Israel. That sounds like tending the regulator. <laughs> It was. That was a that was a tough call, I have to say. Um he was a prophet and he heard God's voice clearly and even if he could make that prophecy and knew it know it knew it firmly that it was true. So he balked at this mission. He did not want to do it. So what does he do next? Well let's get I mean let's recognize what I mean, make sure we're clear on what that was. He saw the future. He saw the destruction of Israel, or the captivity of Israel, by the Assyrians that he was told to go and talk to. He obviously, as good a prophet as he was, he must have had some personal sense of his nationality, of his culture, of his Jewishness, whatever you want to call it. He let personal sense come in and take him away from obeying God. In this case, it was a personal sense of his nationality or his whatever. So, what did he do next? He ran away. Away. To Tarshish which um, Tom wrote about. It's actually a very far place. He said in Spain on the forum. That was about as, probably as far away as he could possibly go. It was the furthest place that Solomon ever traded. He went as far as Tarsus. Yes. Uh, in the Mediterranean, the far other side of the Mediterranean. And, and I loved what Jeremy wrote on the forum about that. What did, is Jeremy there? Yeah, I'm here. What did you say? I I just was thinking about Tarsus and wondering where it was, and then after a little bit realized it was it was just the not where he was supposed to go, and you know it's sort of a I guess it's a metaphor for wherever we we run away try to run away from God to you know so. It is referred to often in the Bible about going to Tarshish. So it, it is a sense of running away from God, wherever that is, and, and how easy it is to set sail for Tarshish. <laughs> you don't want to do something you know you have to do. Anybody else on that? Uh, and, uh, what I thought was interesting, see, I get these all mixed up, Tarshish and uh, um, Tarsus. So uh, I had to look that up, and... Um, Thanks, Jeremy, for bringing this up. Um, but uh, see, Tarsus is um, where Paul was from in Turkey. 
So I only mention that just because, you know, th these are names of cities that uh, generally most of us are not familiar with, you know, so getting Tarsus and Tarshish kind of mixed up, you know? All right, okay. So two completely different cities, obviously. So Tarsus is in Turkey, that's where Paul was from, and Tarshish is... Um, you know, city in southwest uh, Spain. Um, but on the other hand, to what Jeremy said, a lot of people don't know where it is, but um, I thought it was interesting, and what I found was that um, sometimes it, it was used as a term for just saying the ship was going to travel on a long voyage. Right. So that was about as far away as they could imagine yep. going. And as we've heard, but you can run, but you can't hide. Okay, so he's in this ship now, and a, and a huge storm comes up. And what is what is Jonah doing while this huge storm is coming up? He's sleeping. <laughs> and I think it was Linda who wrote about this too. But if if you were so mesmerized, if you get so deep into willfully disobeying God, all hell can be all around you, and you're you're just a walking zombie. You're asleep. And all the other sailors <laughs> were praying. I mean, I thought it's good for them, even if it was just to their own gods. At least they knew to do something for heaven's sake. And then the shipmaster had to come to him and tell him what? Uh, why, uh, what meanest thou, O sleeper? Arise. Call upon thy God. Thank you. Yes. And they knew, they instinctively knew that something very wicked was going on for this uh, abnormal storm to come out of nowhere. Now, to me, this is such an important point. Think about it today. I mean, we have these weird weather patterns that people just accept. What if we had this sense that, no, this is, this is mortal mind. Something wrong is going on. And, and handle it that way. You know, we knew when Storm Sandy hit us that it was it was something wicked was happening. And uh, we need to be aware of that. <laughs> Things would change. They they knew this so many years ago. And uh, fortunately, Jonah knew it was him and did what? Told him to cast him over. Yes. The sailors really didn't want to do that, but they didn't have a choice. I read when uh, in Matthew Henry where he says, when sin is the Jonah that raises the storm, it must be thrown out in this way into the sea. We must drown what would otherwise drown us. That's cutting off your right arm so you don't offend your left or whatever Jesus said. Sometimes you've you got to get rid of it some way or another. And, and it, it, Shahida wrote, and rightly so, that it showed Jonah was truly repentant, that he admitted to it and he was willing to jump into the ocean. That's real repentance. So then what happens? The storm ceased and the fish swallowed Jonah. Yes. And it is there that Jonah, even in a terrible situation like that, prayed and, rep and further made repentance. And, of course, we know the end of the story. But uh, think about it. If you ever, if we ever have any of these storms or things, or if you're ever in a situation like that, Pray, and, and if there's any repentance to be done, repent. This is how they handle those storms. I think that's remarkable that they did it that way, and not they did it, and it worked. Usually the, the storms, it's mortal mind. It's agitated mortal mind in its worst form, and Mrs. Eddy says we should be able to handle the weather even more easily than sin, disease, or death. So it's our duty to do this, to make sure we are praying, to either, we should do it so they don't even arise, so the storms don't even come up. That's neutralizing mortal mind, what is bitter in it, 
Otherwise, it would seem to result in these untoward weather conditions. Mrs. Eddy did it. We, we have done it, and we must continue to do it. Handle the weather. And all of you know there are pages about this, which she has written on how to do it. She said when a bad storm was coming over Pleasant View, she looked up at the storm clouds and saw the face of God, and they dispersed. And she had certain people in her household working on weather specifically for that. And each one of you should be in your own area, in your own community, and then of our nation and our world. This is not selfish work. It reaches out to bless everyone. I thought it was interesting um, that when he was on the ship during the storm, he was asleep. You know, when you're in the wrong mind, Everything seems to be laborious uh, and, and tiring. It tires you out. I notice when I'm when I lose, you know, when I drift off, I feel tired much more easily, and I want to go. To, you know, I want to take a nap or go to sleep or whatever. That's what happened to the disciples when Jesus was in his last agony. It gets them, and he, and he asked to watch, and they fell asleep. Yeah. When the pressure is hot, if you're in the wrong mind, it's going to put you literally asleep. It's going to wear you out to where you feel like you need to sleep. You know, Martha Wilcox addresses that, too. She says, you know, when you're overstressed, she says it's the wrong self of, of a wrong sense of self, uh, you know, you're just you're thinking of yourself as doing everything no, instead of knowing that it's God that works in you and through you. It does lead to exhaustion, stress. All of those are indications to get back to God that you, you have drifted off in some way. And this study says right in the, in the textbook somewhere that when you are working for God, when you're working hard for God, it actually rests you instead of weary, and you require less repose. You require less because it's, it's energizing. That's what Christ said. He said, uh, Come unto me, all that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And then he says, Because I am meek and lowly in heart. My yoke is, take my yoke upon you. I am meek and lowly in heart. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. And what is it that gives you rest? God. It's Christ that gives you rest. Whenever Jesus referred to himself, he always referred to the Christ, not the person. When, you're, when, when, the, when that mind, which is within Christ, is in you, that is what gives you rest, having the mind of Christ. Yes, all of this, all of these lessons are so apropos for us right now, and that's why the Bible is the chart of life. And that is why it is so important we study it and know what's in it. It would only be, uh, you know, a wicked, something very wicked that would make you think you shouldn't study the Bible or don't care to know what's in it. Um, because it can only help and bless you. Especially when we have these discussions where we make it our own and realize how we can from the lives of others in the Bible. I thought it was two. Uh, Matthew Henry made a couple of comments. One, one was, he said, if you want to learn to pray, go to sea. <laughs> Hell, I, <answered. laughs> I know she has a boat. But you go out in the ocean and you, you feel pretty darn helpless. And uh, so many of, of the mariners uh, have <laughs> prayed because they're out there with nothing. Uh, no Savior but God, the Christ. <laughs> 
And that's, that's actually a good place to be. Yes, mentally. So, he prayed even, and that's what we started out this conversation on, even in the, the worst place. And, you know, there are these whales, I read, that have these huge throats, and they can swallow men. In fact, it's what I read that it was a man dressed in armor was found in a whale, belly of a whale, many, many years ago, of course. So, they do have that capacity. <laughs> Some of them do, anyway. Um, even in that in that dire strait, he prayed and was saved. Did, Linda, do you want to say anything about what you wrote on the forum? They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy. Oh, yeah. I probably have to go back, but actually I think I wrote it down in my book. What part of this? And you said observe, um, they that observe was to worship and to cling to. Um, lying vanities were... Oh, yes. You're neg neg neglecting the will of God. So observing was worshiping or clinging or regarding to something or giving way to something. And lying vanities was worthless idols that deceive, deceive those that serve them and have you pursue them. Pursue them. And then... Forsaking your own mercy was forfeiting your covenant grace or God's love for you, and you're turning your back on God's mercy. Thank you. Yeah, I thought that, that was interesting. So he certainly did see what he had done, and he went on to fulfill his God-given mission, as difficult as that was for him. Uh, and it was true that the people of you believed God, and God saw their work, that they turned from their evil way. So, uh, something else I'm going to get into today, but there was so much in this lesson. One I'd like you to think of, I, I don't know whether we have a lot of time to go into it, but uh, I consider it a checklist. It's citation eight in Science and Health. People go into ecstasies over the sense of a corporeal Jehovah. So without a scarcely spark of love in their hearts, yet God is love. And without love, God, immortality cannot appear. Mortals try to believe without understanding truth. God is truth. Mortals claim that death is inevitable, but man's eternal principle is ever-present life. Mortals believe in a finite personal God, while God is infinite love, which must be unlimited. So you can ask yourself, do you do those things? I mean, you, you, know, you worship God, but do you love? Do you just believe and have no understanding of this truth? Do you think death is inevitable? Most people do. But we're, here we know that man's eternal principle is ever-present life. And then do you believe in a finite personal God, in a personal sense of self, while God is infinite love, which must be unlimited? Lawrence gave a good testimony on, on that, I thought, on Wednesday, where uh, he kept trying to pour in truth. And kind of the whole idea of blood types of love was kind of thought. When she realized it was the blood types of love that did the healing. And she was then she was able to be effective as a uh, scientist. And I I know myself growing up in a Boston affiliated Sunday school thinking that somehow it was the word that did the healing. It was the truth. He just knew the right truth to heal whatever he healed. And then feeling so um, incapable when I couldn't find the right truth to heal something. And all along, it's totally the wrong the wrong direction because it's the love it's the 
love of God that heals. Unless we can express that love, all you know, all the words of the textbook aren't going to do us any good without love. That he makes it clear. Love is the heart and soul of Christian science. So if you are having trouble, and she has said that when a student asked her, she said you're having trouble in healing, she said to love more. And it's the, the divine love. And if you're doing anything and there's no love in it, then you just better stop. You're a tinkling symbol, as, as Corinthians speaks about. And a sounding breath. There must be love, and I don't care if you know all the letters and all the words. If, if there's the love does not accompany it, then it is nothing. Nothing. Now, I'm going to switch over to something, since this is Independence Day weekend. And Connie recommended to me a book called The Light and the Glory. Right. Yes, yeah, yeah, she, she did. Yeah. Okay. God's Plan for America, 1492 to 1793. And, and Connie, right after you recommended it, I, I ordered it, got it, and Mary's been reading it. <laughs> I haven't gotten the first chapter, but I have, I'm going to have to read some of this to you. I read it to Gary the other night, and he said, well, you have to give this at the round table. You know, we, we have talked about here the golden thread that there's something through the ages, there's a sense of God that has been through all the ages in the Bible and and in in our founding of our country, throughout time it's been some God working. And we've talked about George Washington and more recently Albert Einstein. Well, I'm gonna to read to you selections from this book. And I just as an introduction I want to say this book was written by two guys who felt very deeply that somehow God must have directed people to found this nation. And, and they felt it intuitively, very deeply. And so they researched, uh, going all the way back to Columbus, even before Christopher Columbus, they researched and they found things that shocked even them. And that's what this book is about things that they have found through history that none of us have ever learned in school. Yeah, and they made a point. This isn't about rabid Christians trying to promote Christian and Christianity. This is the truth. They found ancient uh, books and things translated into English uh, at, at Yale Library and other places. So, it's like a hundred pages or something of footnotes. It's just huge. It, it is. It's amazing, and yet it makes perfect sense. But you see, animal magnetism or air would like all this to be hidden, so nobody knows about it. So we're just drifting around, you know, hoping for the best. And, and so, and also, as we've always said, America was the cradle for Christian science. It had to have been founded here. Okay. At the time, quote, at the time of the birth of our republic, Samuel Adams, one of its chief, chief progenitors, declared, quote, a general dissolution of principles and manners, meaning mores, not table manners, will more surely overthrow the liberties of America than the whole force of the common enemy. While the people are virtuous, they cannot be subdued. But once they lose their virtue, they will be ready to surrender their liberties to the first external or internal invader. Yet, if virtue and knowledge are diffused among the people, they will never be enslaved. This will be their great security. Now, of course, this goes along in Science and Health, where Mrs. Eddy talks about Eric cannot go past, be passed around when virtue and truth build a strong defense. We are being called on to be virtuous, truthful, <laughs> We're, right now, we're not in the middle of some huge war where everything is being blown apart. And we don't want this for our children. But it will happen if we do not do this work, this mission, if you will, that we're called to do. Okay, so that was Samuel Adams. Now, and it goes. 
and I sure never knew this. Here's what Co Christopher Columbus himself said about why he came to the Americas. And it talks about uh, Peter, who's one of the authors, Peter Marshall, began to read a few translated excerpts from an obscure volume of Columbus's, which had never previously appeared in English. This is a quote from Christopher Columbus. It was the Lord who put into my mind, I could feel his hand upon me, the fact that it would be possible to sail here from the Indies. All who heard of my project rejected it with laughter, ridiculing me. There is no question that the inspiration was from the Holy Spirit, because he comforted me with rays of marvelous inspiration from the Holy Scriptures. I am a most unworthy sinner, but I have cried out to the Lord for grace and mercy, and they have covered me completely. I have found the sweetest consolation since I made it my whole purpose to enjoy his marvelous presence. For the execution of the journey to the Indian Indies, I did not make use of intelligence, mathematics, or maps. It is simply the fulfillment of what Isaiah had prophesied. No one should fear to undertake my task in the name of our Savior, if it is just and if the intention is purely for his holy service. The working out of all things has been assigned to each person by our Lord, but it all happens according to his sovereign will, even though he gives advice. He lacks nothing that is, that is in the power of men to give him. Oh, what a gracious Lord, who desires that people should perform for him those things for which he holds himself responsible. Day and night, moment by moment, everyone should express their most devoted gratitude to him. End quote. Did any of you ever hear that before? No. 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 Christopher Columbus wrote that. He wrote it in an obscure document that was found. Probably it was considered unauthorized literature. <laughs> so, they, when they read that, they were these authors of this book. They were blown away because they, as I, as Gary was saying, they felt that there had been some uh, plan, some divine plan for our country, which gives us this freedom that we so richly enjoy every day and most likely take for granted. So uh, it goes on. I thought this was important too. He, they found they found a book in a bookstore um, called Redeemer Nation. But it says further browsing in the history section revealed that the first settlers consciously thought of themselves as a people called into a covenant relationship with God, similar to the one he had established with ancient Israel. The pilgrims and Puritans, looking at the parallels between the ways in which God had led them to America and the Old Testament stories of God's dealing with ancient Israel, saw themselves as called to be found a new Israel, in their phrase, which would be a light to the whole world, a city set upon a hill, was how John Winthrop, the first governor of Massachusetts, envisioned it. A covenant, my friends. They had made a covenant. They, they lived their, their, quote, religion. They made a covenant with God, and they felt that this covenant, they were coming to this new world, which to them was like the new Israel, and that it was going to do tremendous things. This was in their heart. So, see, another quote. In his journal, Christopher Columbus described an incident that took place on his fourth and final voyage after he'd been made governor and subsequently had been forcibly removed from that command for gross mismanagement. Sick with a fever in the depths of despair, he had a half-awake dream in which he heard a stern voice strongly rebuke him for his self-pity. The voice, quoted, reminded him that the Almighty had singled him out for the honor of bearing the light of Christ to a new world, had given him all that he had asked for, and was recording in heaven every event of his life. Now he had clear evidence that God was leading, leading him in the project. Here in Columbus's own words was a concrete example of God's hand at work in the life and the person that he used to bring Europeans to the Americas. To the Americas. So, again, 
And then again, it goes back to the covenant, um, talk, talking about the covenant. Uh, it said that, you know, the ner- early New Englanders, they had a very pure form of, of government, and it was based on this covenant. They said it, that they felt it was possible to live a life together that reflected the commandments of Christ, to love God with all their heart, soul, and mind, and strength, and to love others as themselves. And this call was to be worked out in terms of the settler's covenant with each other. Um, and it says the pattern for this first successful government in the Western Hemisphere, and even his Histrians and sociologists have long regarded the New England town meetings as the purest and most successful form that democracy has ever taken. But few, if any, have acknowledged what lay at the core of how and why they work so well. There would be many modifications, but American government owns its inception to the covenants of the first churches on her shores. And then, again, this is, um, here is Senator Daniel Webster, quote, If we in our posterity reject religious instruction and authority, violate the rules of eternal justice, trifle with the injunctions of morality, and recklessly destroy the political constitution which holds us together, no man can tell how sudden a catastrophe may overwhelm us and bury all our glory to profound obscurity. You know, it has happened in the past. You know, it can happen in a moment. I'll be living a happy, happy, happy life, and suddenly it can turn. And this is, again, the importance of what we are doing. I've heard the bell, so I'm going to end it with this. In 1775, when the U.S. Marine Corps was founded, the recruiting, recruiting slogan stated that it was seeking, quote, a few good men, the movie. That is essentially what God said to Gideon in ancient Israel when he reduced his, harmony from 32, his army from 32,000 to 300. And it was what he seemed to be saying three and a half centuries ago as he began to gather those who were willing to give up everything for his sake in order to dwell in his new Israel. How much of the grace that continues to cover this country today, and how many of the incredible blessings that have been poured out upon this land are a direct result of, result of their obedience and willingness to die to self. God only knows for certain. That grace seems to be lifting now. But as we look through our nation's history to discover God's plan, we begin to see what a great difference a few dedicated people can make and how much is still at stake. For God's call to this country has never been revoked. America, America, God shed his grace on thee. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good service and know what it means and how it is going out to all mankind.